Hello, I'm Seema and welcome to part one of the chapter Organic Chemistry, Some Basic Principles and Techniques. We have studied a little bit about carbon and its compounds in class 10. And you have a little bit of idea, yet I would be reintroducing the topic to you. Carbon as an element is very, very interesting. Do you know, if we just keep out of the entire periodic table, if we just kept carbon separate and all the other elements separate, our study of carbon itself would take, carbon and its compounds itself would take us a whole lifetime. There is so much to study about carbon and its compounds and all the other uh, elements together do not form as many compounds as carbon does. And that is why carbon as an element became very interesting and the study of carbon and its compounds started being called the study of organic chemistry. Let me just start what I've written, what is there in the book and I'll keep explaining as I move forward. Carbon is the sixth element. It has six protons and six electrons and atomic mass is 12. The electronic configuration of carbon is 1s2, 2s2 and 2p2. So you could say it is 1s2, 2s2, 2px1, 2py1 and 2pz is empty. What happens is that since it has four electrons in its outermost shell, according to octet rule, it needs four more electrons to complete its octet. Therefore, carbon has a capacity to form four separate bonds. Now, in order to form four separate bonds, in one orbital, there should be only one electron. But we find in the outermost shell, in the 2s orbital, there are two electrons. Now, one of these electrons jumps up to the p orbitals of the second shell because there is one p orbital that is empty. So that one electron jumps up there and when one electron jumps up to the 2p orbital, the empty 2p orbital, the electron in each of the second shell orbitals occupy one electron each. So 2s has one, 2px has one, 2py has one and 2pz has one. Now all four electrons have separated and have gone into four different orbitals. And this is where the magic begins. Since there cannot be a valency that is uh, for uh, forming covalent bonds, if you follow the octet rule, you cannot have more than a valency of four. If you have a maximum of four electrons which are unpaired, you need four more electrons to complete the octet. Therefore, carbon has this unique property that it can form lots of covalent bonds. Having four free sites to form those covalent bonds, it forms lots of bonds. And it forms bonds not only with other elements, it forms bonds with itself. Because each carbon atom has such a strong tendency to form bonds, carbon starts forming bonds with itself. And this property is known as catenation. So due to the property of catenation, carbon shows catenation. So it forms bonds with other carbon atoms resulting in the formation of chains, in the formation of tree-like structures where you have branches of the chain, you have rings. So it can form many, many structures and the carbon chains can be long, they could be short, they could be, uh, as I told you, branched, they could be pretty complex. So a lot of variety is possible only with carbon chains and therefore carbon forms a lot of compounds just by combining with other carbon atoms. So carbon shows catenation and in addition to combining with other carbon atoms, it also combines with other elements. For example, it combines to form covalent bonds with hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus and halogens. So we see it virtually makes covalent bonds with as many um, atoms or uh, groups of active atoms that are uh, possible. And therefore, the variety of compounds that carbon gives is really huge. It's an enormous number of compounds. Now, the study of carbon compounds came to be known as organic chemistry. Now, the question is, why did we try to relate the name organic? Because initially, when the science of uh, chemistry was really very young, and the chemists were trying to extract compounds from here and there, from plants, from minerals, from air, from water. They were trying to understand the chemistry of the world that surrounded them. 
and they found every time they got a compound from some organism that would usually contain carbon. And that is why that initial classification, one, the number of carbon compounds was very large, so it was easier to just keep them separate and study about them separately. Second, most of them were obtained from organic sources and therefore there originated the name organic chemistry. The study of these compounds is known as organic chemistry. Organic compounds are vital for sustaining life on Earth. As I told you, chemists were finding these carbon compounds in organisms, from organisms, whether living or dead. So it means that they play a very important role in living organisms. So they play a vital role for sustaining life on Earth. And they include complex molecules like DNA and proteins that form the structure that are present in all the cells. They are present in blood. They are used up to make muscles. They form the skin. The clothing that we wear has got organic compounds. The fuels that we use have got organic compounds. The polymers that we are using, the polyethene bags that you use, all polystyrene, uh, that is the thermocol that you use, all of these are organic compounds. You have so many dyes that are organic compounds, so many medicines, obviously, when you're using it on organisms, the medicines would also be organic compounds. So organic chemistry or organic compounds find an extensive use in sustaining life. And therefore, they are more extremely important for us to know them because it is a question of our life and death. Our existence depends on our knowledge of these compounds. The science of organic chemistry is pretty old. It's almost 200 years old. In 1780, the chemists, they started distinguishing organic compounds or organic chemistry and the rest of the inorganic chemistry. The compounds of carbon were organic chemistry and the compounds and study of all other elements was inorganic chemistry. So, Around 1780, the chemists, they started distinguishing organic compounds as those obtained from organisms. And there was one scientist called Berzelius, and Berzelius was a smart guy and perhaps a religious guy also. He said that organic compounds can only be obtained from organisms. Because by now, what the scientists were doing was, they were, the study was at a very elemental stage. They were still learning about things around them. So whenever they would try and get something from an organism, they would get a carbon compound. So he said, for carbon compound to exist, a vital force, a vitality or a life force is necessary. And only if a thing is living right now or may have lived at some time, it had to be a living thing. So he gave the vital force theory, which said that only the uh, organisms which have vitality, which are vital, they can be a source of organic compounds and non-vital, that is non-living things, cannot be a source of organic compounds. He could be more wrong because very soon he was proved wrong. And he was proved to be wrong by a scientist called Waller and F. Waller, who in 1828 synthesized a compound, an organic compound, urea, and he obtained it from ammonium cyanate, which was pretty much an inorganic compound. So from an inorganic source, he created an organic compound, right? Now, imagine, you know, when you're reading these, go back in that time, imagine that they know nothing and they are still trying to find, it's like solving a mystery, you know? And they found he was the man who created urea and he created it from ammonium cyanate, which was an inorganic compound. And by till now, it was being believed that for an organic compound to exist, it was necessary that the vital force be there, that, that the source be organic. But that was not so. The moment urea, which is carbamide, was created by Waller, the, the vital force theory had to be dismantled. It, it became invalid. It did not mean anything anymore. Now, it was known to scientists, no, you, you do not need a vital force. And it is not true that carbon compounds can only be obtained from living organisms. You can get them from inorganic sources too. But scientists never go by a single example. 
So once Waller had done this, there were other scientists who came in and they wanted to, they also wanted to disprove this or they tried to uh, prepare organic compounds from inorganic sources and they were also successful. And who was it? It was Kobe in 1845. He synthesized acetic acid and acetic acid was again, he synthesized it from inorganic sources. And the next was Bechtelou. Bechtelou was a French chemist in 1856, as early as 1856. He synthesized methane from inorganic sources. So these examples of other scientists also being successful in creating organic compounds from inorganic sources completely killed the vital, vital uh, force theory. So now Berzelius, uh, by now, uh, what he had said, it did not mean anything. But when we study about the history of how organic chemistry came about, it becomes important to know why it was named organic chemistry, what was the idea that they had and how that very basis actually became wrong when these examples were created where it was these compounds were obtained from inorganic sources. Yet we chose to uh, maintain the name of organic chemistry. We chose to keep on studying carbon and its compounds separately as organic chemistry because no doubt you can obtain it from inorganic sources. They still form majorly compounds which are obtained in the organic, um, in the organic world. And secondly, it is such a vast subject that we would rather have it separate and not merge it with the rest of the chemistry. It helped us to make it a sub separate subject. So Bechtelou, he synthesized methane and all these examples showed conclusively that organic compounds can be synthesized from inorganic sources in the laboratory. You don't have to be in a living organism to get an organic compound. It can be prepared in the laboratory. And the development of the electronic theory of covalent bonding. Now, the electronic theory of covalent bonding is what, you know, what it starts with this, that you have uh, atoms which are surrounded by electrons of the outermost shell and these electrons of the outermost shell, they are the ones that form bonds. So when we see that carbon has got four electrons in the outermost shell, or uh, in a plane surface, I can show you these four electrons as four corners of a square. or if I draw lines from one to the other, the angle between each would be a 90 degree. In reality, the atom is not in a, on a page. It is, it is in three dimensions. Therefore, these four electrons, they occupy the maximum distance that they can from each other. And that distance is where but you have one electron here, you have one electron here, one there and one there. So it, it, imagine a sphere and the four dots occupying maximum distance from each other. And then if you join the center, the angle that you get is 109 degrees 28 minutes. That is the angle of a tetrahedron. So these four, it will form four separate bonds in the form of a tetrahedron. So this electronic theory that electrons, one electron from one atom and one electron from the other atom which is bonding, that would form a bond which would be known as a covalent bond. And if you know the number of covalent bonds and the orientation and the structures that they would form, you can guess all of it by knowing the valency, by knowing the hybridization, you have studied all this in chapter 4, where we did chemical bonding and molecular structure. So, um, it would be a good idea to revise a little bit of that now. And although in the next video, I'll be taking this up a little more. So with this, I'll wind up today's video. If you found it helpful, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel, recommend it to your friends. And please keep returning for more videos on chemistry. Thank you for watching and bye-bye for now.